Welcome. I guess you guys are all the data scientists and nerds, which is great. You know, I, I'm doing a lot of big presentations and a lot of arm waving this week, but really, this is where my heart is, is actually like looking at the data, figuring out indicators. And and whenever I, quite rarely these days, but whenever I get the task of actually configuring indicators, it's my favorite thing to do, because, which is kind of a, I don't know, some people find it tragic, but honestly, I find it like you're actually solving a problem as opposed to, and like giving someone a value, a result that they can actually use for something as opposed to, you know, just answering emails, um, right? And so what we're going to do is we have been making uh, continuous advances in the ability of DHIS2 to calculate values, you know, conti well, continuously. Like, you know, um, the every year we make m more and more functionality to calculate different things. Now, of course, we're not trying to build in unlimited flexibility, right? I mean, you can always pull out your data. You can run some your own SQL. You can do whatever you, it is that you want. Um, but as the needs come in, we try to update DHIS2 generically to be able to accommodate the calculations um, that you require for your DHIS2 implementations. And of course, right now, you know, DHIS2 is implemented in so many different places and so many different domains. The needs are outstretching this, the, the supply. So we do see quite a lot of community innovations around the ability to calculate more advanced things as Lars was demonstrating with uh, some of his apps and stuff uh, yesterday. Uh, it's all one, it's all part of one big happy family, but what we'll demonstrate today is some of the latest innovations with the core applications. So no additional technology required, no additional apps required to download from the App Hub, just what you're able to do in indicators uh, and predictors in DHIS2. We're going to start with the use cases around data quality. As promised, if you're just in the data quality presentation, I showed you, I said, we're going to show you how we're going to be able to make all of those new data quality metrics that we talked about in there in this session. So uh, we'll use that as kind of a starting use case and um, jump right into it. Jim, anything before we get started? No. no? Okay. Yeah, data quality use cases. And then uh, Jim's going to chime in as we go through that one. And then uh, I'm going to hand it off to Jim to take us through some of the more advanced indicator features that aren't necessarily related to data quality, but we do want to highlight as well. So the three that we're going to start with are um, data element reporting rates. You heard in the last presentation that basically everyone in the world has been dependent upon data set reporting rates since you know the inception of DHIS2. And what we know from now 30 plus years of DHIS2 implementation, just health information systems research, it's not good. It's not good enough. It, it's not an accurate measurement of data quality. If you're using data set reporting rates as your main metric for data quality, you're not doing data quality, just to put it bluntly. So we know it's not reliable. What it actually has is, is incentivize people to go in, put in all zeros, mark the form complete, uh, instead of actually putting in the real data. That's what it's been very successful at. But what it has not been successful at is actually improving data quality and making sure that the data is actually there and the people are taking time to uh, fill out their data entry forms. Um, so we are pivoting all of our strategy and guidance over to individual data value reporting rates and consistent consistency. So data element reporting rates. So we're going to get into how those are calculated, different methodologies. Then we also have facility reporting consistency. What we've seen in many, many countries is that while you may have 98% reporting rates, when you actually get into that 2% variation from month to month, you see that a large proportion of your facilities are not consistently reporting every month, right? In some countries, you've seen that you have 98% reporting rates, but you may have, over the last 12 months, 40% of facilities missed a month, right? What do we do with those gaps? If we actually really want to see our interventions having impact, can we rely on our impact indicators? We need really, really consistent data, especially if we're doing anything with machine learning or AI. You have to have really consistent uh, data. Every month, the data is there. And so that 40% of facilities that have just missed a month, what do we do? Well, actually many interventions, especially some of the epidemiologists like CDC stuff, they just remove them more or less. They just only depend on that 60% that did actually have the full 12 months of data. 
for some of their analysis. So we need to be very concerned about not just reporting rates and not just data element reporting rates, but did every facility report for every single month? And we have some new metrics for that. And then also, of course, outliers are plaguing everyone. We have many new tools for uh, detecting outliers. We have new calculations for outliers. And more importantly, we have the ability to calculate the impact of an outlier. So of your values that you have, how much, what percentage of those values is being contributed to by outliers, right? How do we know how bad our outliers are, right? So we say, okay, we have... Um, 15% of our data for this indicator comes from outlier values. Can we use that? Can we use that indicator? Knowing that 15% of it is highly, highly uh, suspect to being data quality issue? Probably not. But how do we even know that? Right? We have new tools. We have new ways of calculating the impact of indicator, or sorry, of outliers. Uh, all right, so let's just jump straight into data element reporting rates, just to cover a little bit of uh, the various approaches before we get into actually how it's configured. So when we talk about data element reporting rates, the numerate is a calculation, right? So um, with a numerator and a denominator, and the numerator should be quite obvious. So the numerator is the data values that were reported. So we're counting all of the data values that were, that were reported, right? But we have various choices for what our denominator is. And it's kind of subject to the, the types of numerators that you have or the kind of analysis that you want to perform. So it's not necessarily one is better than the other, uh, but I'll go through kind of each one of the four uh, quite quickly. So the first one is the denominator is the number of expected reports from the data set. So how do we know the expected reports? That's the org units that are assigned to the data set. So if you assign an org unit to data set, then DHIS2 assumes that you have, you're expecting that data set, or sorry, you're expecting that org unit to report on that data set. And so the number of org units that are assigned to that data set becomes the number of expected reports. Okay. And this is very easy to turn on in an indicator. Uh, it's just one of the tabs there. You just drop down and say the number of expected reports and you just plug that into your denominator. The other alternative denominator for this is the number of received reports. So um, of the actual facilities that mark the data set complete, that is the actual number of received reports you have. That's what DHIS2 is calculating the received reports is the number of facilities that have marked the data set complete. When to use one over the other? Well, there's... It, it really depends on kind of your reporting structure and, and, and system. If you have really, really, really good org unit, man, uh, org unit and data set management, meaning that as facilities come online, you're assigning them to the proper data sets. As facilities go offline, you're removing them from the data set assignment. Um, then you could probably use number one. If you're like most countries and you're not managing that, as tightly as you should be, well, as tightly as, well, ideally would be done, then probably number two is a more accurate measurement. Does this make sense? Because most countries, they're having, or they're having new facilities come online all the time, and they're just blank assigning data sets to all org units, right? It's so easy to do in DHS2. We've, it's very easy just to assign all org units to all data sets. Instead of actually going in and saying, okay, this facility just opened and they do this data set, this data set, this data set, but not these, right? Which is the best practice, but again, quite an administrative burden to keep on top of. So uh, if that's your reality, then number two is probably better. Number three and four are a little bit more nuanced. Number three is the data values reported for a related data element. So if you say like, I'm, report, I'm checking the reporting rate of A and C2, then you could say your denominator is the number of A and C1s reported. Or you could have a denominator um, that you would expect there always to be a value for. For example, what's a, data, what's a value captured at health facilities that you always expect there to be a non-null value, zero or greater? Any examples? Number of visits. Yeah, of course. You always expect there to be some visits to a health facility every month, right? Um, and 
Um, and so number of visits could be a proxy denominator, right? You expect there always to be, but maybe, um, and if there's, if there's a, a blank for number of visits, then something else is going wrong, right? Uh, and then the other one is facilities, number four here, is facilities that have previously reported. So for example, if this facility has reported on this data value in the past, I expect them to report on it this month too. Does that make sense? So we can count how did this facility report on, say, in the past 12 months? Did they report on this? And then we can say, yes, they did. Then I also expect them to report this month. OK? So number one and two are quite simple. If, you're, if, you, if you don't have DHIS2 etched into your brain, then maybe you're like, I don't know actually how to do that. But once you get into the indicator uh, dialogue and uh, expression builder, you see that number one and two are extremely easy. I'm only going to cover number three and four because those are much more complex to configure in DHIS2. Um, yeah, did I even put the expression in here? We'll see some sample expressions later. OK. All right, yeah, so we'll come back to uh, number three. But so a related data element, we yeah, we'll cover this. So this is essentially a count if it's a non-null, non right? So count the number, uh, and we'll see that in a second. Number four, again, which is reported on the, um, uh, has the facility ever reported? What we're able to do here is we're able to use some of the new uh, if is not null statements in the indicator uh, builder. So we can say if this value is not null, and then we can even use the period offset functionality to say minus one, which is last month, or is not null period offset minus two, which is the month before that, or is not null. And we can go all the way back in time as far as you want to write the expression. And we'll see some examples of that in just a second. Um, just one thing to uh, point out, there's a bit of nuance here that I won't get in for the sake of time, but many data elements are being um, disaggregated by various category option combinations. So you say you have like BCG doses, but then you have like under one, over one, male, female kind of thing, right? Those are disaggregations. And there's obviously a bit of complexity when you're talking about data element reporting rates when there's a disaggregation of those data elements. So which value are you actually assessing? Because you have to choose. You have to choose. So say I have a BCG under one, over one, male, female. That's four different values that I expect for one data element, right? So we're talking about data element reporting, right? You have to say, do I expect one of those? Do I, or do I expect four of those? Or do I expect some combination of those four? Right? Does this make sense? So you kind of have to you kind of have to choose, um, and when you're configuring it, you have to come up with a bit of a, a strategy there. I think many people would say I want to default to say like BC. In this example, you kind of have to know the programs, right? But you say like BCG under uh, one male. I basically always expect that, or under one male and female, or something like that. And then that's what I'm using as my actual measurement of that data element reporting uh, rate, as opposed to saying all four of those. Does that make sense? OK. Yeah. So um, one of the things we've been doing in recent releases is trying to put more functionality into indicators to get these things directly on your dashboard or through a validation rule. Uh, and we have a lot of ability that we've always had in predictors to go back and look at past data or compare things at the facility level. And then you can get a count of facilities in each district or country that conform to some, uh, some test. We've been working to move some of that uh, into indicators so that you don't have to have the overhead of defining a predictor, which then writes something back into the data value table, and then you test it with an indicator. So um, for data value completeness, we're, we're doing pretty well in getting the functionality now moved over into indicators that used to be only possible 
in program rules. And that's through a um, an indicator function called subexpression. And I'll go in the next couple of slides, I'll go into more detail what subexpressions are, what they do. But um, anyway, you can you can so if you only wanted to look only for a single data element in one period, um, you've always been able, able to do that with predictors. We have uh, our first implementation of subexpressions could do that in in 2.38.1. They didn't quite make it in time for the for the feature freeze for testing for 238, so we held it over and put it in 238.1. Um, if you want to uh, look and see if uh, all category, all disaggregations for data are, are reported in one period, then you're getting into looking at multiple uh, data values in one period for one organization unit. And that's something that the initial implementation of subexpressions couldn't do, but that was added in, in 240. And then finally, in, by, in, by 242, we added the ability to go back in time. So you could look and say, uh, any of these reports uh, was a value present in any of several periods, or was the value present in all of several periods? I want to look, find the facilities where the, they would report it every month in the last 12, or some fraction. Find all the facilities where they reported in in nine out of the last ten months, or eight out of the last ten months, or or find the ones that underreported only in one or two out of the last ten months, or twelve months. Yeah. So, a subexpression. What is it? A subexpression is a is a it's a function that you can put inside an indicator expression, and whatever's in the contents of that subexpression is evaluated for each org unit, evaluated independently for each org unit. Most of the time when you write an indicator expression, you say, give me a count of something or give me a sum of something, and I'm reporting per district or per country. It takes all of that and aggregates it all the way up to the to the country for that period or to the district. What the sub-expression does is says, take this logic and just evaluate that logic within an org unit. So that logic may return one, if the org unit has this kind of data, it may return zero if the org unit has some other kind of data. Then in your report, as you sum those up, all the org units up to your district or your country or province, whatever, then you can get a count of org units, organization units, facilities, whatever, that meet some logical definition. So that's the, the, the tool of sub-expressions that before they were put into indicators, you could only do this by running a predictor, storing a one or a zero for each org unit, and then going back into analytics and, and, some, and seeing how they are. So in the first implementation of sub-expressions, we were able to, to do that, but uh, only can reference one data element in each org unit and period. So it was basically looking at each each row coming out of the database and saying, Okay, what's in that value? So that was good to say, find me all the all the facilities where the there were more than 10 suspected malaria cases. Where you're just looking at one data element, which is the number of, but they weren't good at saying, find me the facilities that had so many malaria cases per capita. Or so many, they they couldn't do the numerator denominator thing. They could just look at a single thing. In 240, there was a major re rewrite of the sub-expression so that it could operate on all data values within an organization. And so you can get one, one data element disaggregations. You can say, as Scott was saying, where it was the under one and over one was reported, was the male reported and the female reported. You can look at all the disaggregations. Yes, question. Yeah, the question is, can we look at only the male or the age group? And I will, I will, yes, the answer is yes. And uh, and you can see in the next slide, uh, some of the flexibility that, well, sorry, about three slides from now. So within the sub-expression, here, here are some of the things that go on to show you the, the building blocks 
for the slide I'm finally going to show you, which has all of this put together. Um, you can do, there's flexibility with how you can aggregate the values inside of an organization unit. And if, if the, it's numeric data that you're looking at, uh, by default, a sub-expression will evaluate it according to the aggregation type for that, that is configured for that data element. And so if it's the data element says use sum, we use sum. If it says average, we use average, and so on. Uh, some data elements have complex types. They say, you know, uh, average, but sum across the organization units. So here, we're just looking within the organization unit, so we just do the sum. We don't yet do the average across organization units, or whatever is across organization units. Um, if it's non-numeric data, we use max. Non-numeric data doesn't report uh, so well in, in uh, indicators because they return numbers, but we can use tests to see. And so you can take, um, for non-numeric table, this, this includes booleans. If you have ones and zero, if you have booleans, they're interpreted as, as, as one and zero. And so this will say, did I have any true values? If you have multiple values that you're aggregating within the organization unit. Um, but you can override by using the aggregation type function. So within the sub expression, you can have a data element dot aggregation type average. This means that within the sub expression, it's going to use the average. Let, find me the average uh, count of new positive or, or whatever you're looking at. And next slide. There's also flexibility and you could use uh, outside the aggregation once you already have the once you already determine the value for an organization unit, then what do you want to look at? You want to look at the sum of all the, the organization unit values in the district or the max or the min or the average. For that, outside the closing parentheses of the sub expression, you can also use aggregation type and, and say what you want. Which, which districts had facilities that didn't do this or did do that? Okay, so that's one thing about the, the aggregation type override, uh, very powerful within, within indicators. It lets you define your data element, and it's, it's used not just only in sub-expression, but anywhere in an indicator you can use the aggregation type override. Yeah. Uh, some, other, some other building blocks before we get to the full-blown example for, a, for data element completeness. Uh, you can say if... You can use the if function. It works just like the Excel function. If something test, then the value of true and the value of false. Um, so you can say if a uh, some date element, uh, if it's not null, if it's present, then have a one, otherwise a zero. So you can use this to, to count things. And the data element can be a data element, or it can be data element dot disaggregation. So you can find, you know, the, the number of new cases for male under five, the number of new cases for female under five, whatever you want to, want to do there. Um, another thing, another way you can use the if function is you can see if the value of the data element is, is some value, then you can return one, otherwise zero. Did I have all four, if you have four disaggregations, you can say we're all four of them present. Um, other building blocks, you can use period offset. This was something that, that uh, came in with 2.40.2, uh, a new feature uh, to use them within sub-expression. So you can say, what was the value from the previous period? Or offset negative one, what was the value from two periods earlier? You can even use positive numbers, but often you don't have the data entered yet for the, for the future periods, but it's, it's mathematically possible. And finally, one more thing. Uh, as we said, you can use the, the aggregation type count. So if you want to just get a count of data element values, and don't, we don't care what the value is. And for data element completeness, that's usually what you want to know. How many data elements of how many data values for that data element are in the are in the query. So here's a full-blown expression you can use in the 
numerator or the denominator, as Scott was saying, of an indicator. If you want to answer the question, what facilities had all the disaggregations entered in all of the past 12 months? Now, this assumes that you have a data element with four disaggregations. By the way, feel free to take pictures. This, uh, this presentation is also linked in the program, and you can go there and, and review it at your leisure. So feel free to take pictures, but you don't have to. You've got it. Um, so this says, if the, the data element with, for last month had four values, and for up to the 12 months before, all had four values. Now, the trick is, at the end of the if statement, I put aggregation type count. This is still inside the sub-expression. And so the aggregation type count applies to every one of the things inside the if statement. So I only have to write it once in the, in the formula. That's, that's a little uh, trick for keeping the formula not quite so uh, complicated. So this will, will show me. So I'm saying if all these things are true, if it was there last month and the month before and so on, uh, and 12 months ago, then return a one if it was there all those months. And it was four all those months. Otherwise, return a zero. So for this org unit, we'll have a one if we had four values for each of the last 12 months. Otherwise, we'll have a zero. And then you can count how many, which org units had complete reporting in the last year. Um, yeah, I'll show you another another example. This logic, yes, please. Yes, yes, it would work the same if the aggregation type was already count. But a lot of times you want things to be summed by default, but you can override it in your data com element completeness formula. Yes, another question. Ah, good question. Can you use this for indicators or does it have to be data elements? This has, within a sub-expression, it has to be data elements. Yeah, we don't export indicate, we don't support indicators inside a sub-expression or at least not yet. Yes, another question. Absolutely, absolutely. You can, when all else fails with indicators, you can usually solve the problem using predictors. Yeah, what, another question? Is it a, a question, is, is it a Boolean element? Uh, this can be any, any kind of value because we're just looking at the count of them. And in fact, there was a bug for Boolean data elements and I'll, I'll address that later in the, in the... Oh, the sub-expression. The sub-expression returns any number you want. So in this case, we're just returning a one or a zero, but if you wanted the sub-expression to return any other number, it can do that. And then you're taking that number and uh, it would add up over the org units if, if your report is showing something at the district or country level, if it is showing something greater than an org unit. Jim, we have to make Good sure question. we repeat the questions for folks online. Oh, the question was whether the, whether the result of the sub-expression was only a Boolean, a one or a zero, or can it be not any number? And the answer is it can be any number, but you have to plan and think what are you using that number for, for the total. Yeah, very good questions. Um, so in the next slide, we'll see a different way of, of doing logic. And you can, you can do any logic you want. You can say, if do we have a male and a female? You can say, do we have this age group and that? or but this other age group is optional. It's very, very flexible. You do anything you want. So this just shows one other example where we're saying, let's see where all four uh, disaggregations were specified, but for at least 10 months out of the year. So in this case, we're using a, a nested if statement inside an if statement. So the outside if statement says if all this stuff is greater than or equal to 10, then I'm gonna return a one for this, for this org unit. Now what's the inside stuff? The inside stuff says, if, if that equals four plus, if the next one, uh, if it equals four, put a one, 
plus if the next one you use four, put it a one. So we're getting a one for every month where we had four disaggregations. And again, the trick is we put the aggregation type count inside the sub-expression and around a parentheses that involves all of these. And then the aggregation type count is implicit for everything inside the parentheses where the aggregation count started. And, and so now we're, we're just, um, we're saying if it equals four, we're not testing the value of the data element, we're testing the count of the data values. Yes, George. Oh, question, yes. Asking about the time complexity. This, this code within the indicator actually gets compiled into SQL, into an SQL subquery. So, so it's actually pretty fast. And the reason that we could have sub-expressions in the first place was that we already had the ability to translate, um, to translate the, the expressions like this the building blocks of an expression into SQL because that's how program indicators work. Indicators, before the sub-expression, indicators would always do the query, get the raw values, and then in, in Java, in memory, they would compute the value. Um, so sub-expression is, is, is doing something new in the land of indicators. It's taking everything inside the sub-expression, translating it into SQL, and uh, if, we, if you're interested or if we have time or if you come after, me, after the session, I can tell you in any kind of detail how you want to do that, <laughs> uh, how, how that is done. But it generates a subquery. So you're still just doing one query for the indicator, but it's going through with a, with a, sub, with a fish, fairly efficient subquery for all of the organization units inside whatever you're reporting on. George. The question is for two data elements with the same disaggregation. I know where George is going on this one. <laughs> no, <laughs> without having to add the expression twice. At the moment, so we, we did something with indicators. Um, for George and we're discovering for so predictors. Sorry, we did something for predictors um, for George for for logistics management that were then uh, we just just yesterday I found out that someone else is using it for a completely different purpose for patching data. Uh, that thing is the ability in predictors to say in this data element group evaluate the predictor for each of the data elements and output to a different data element and without having to write a different predictor for each data element. And George has asked me, can we do the same thing with indicators? And I think someday we will. Uh, but it's, it's a question of you know, the, the churn and, and what things we're doing at what point when we can fit that into the development schedule. Um, no, for, so if you wanted to, again, if you wanted to, to put a disaggregation here, and look for specific things. You, you, your, your formula can be as simple or as complicated as you want. And you can decide what things you're looking for for data element completeness, how many of them, how many cases have been in the last 12 months, how many things you're looking for in each month. That's all up to you. Another question. Yeah. <laughs> the comment is that this is a bit wordy. Do you have to list uh, each of the last 12 period offsets? And can we make the syntax a, a little better to, to make it easier to maintain?
Yes. Actually, actually, these are integers, because in this case, we're summing up the integers. Um, oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. If the well, and and here we're saying if the count is four, here we're doing a, a test. Uh, so ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's if okay. Oh, interesting, interesting. So we could have um, something is where essentially the the semantic of the function is if it's non-zero, and then it automatically returns a one or a zero or something like that. Yeah, yeah. There's there's possible one one of the things where I thought you were asking was why are we writing out all twelve of these? And as as we go down the road, um, that's something that that we want to look at. Again, a lot of these functions in DHS two, they were written for some other purpose. And the reason we wrote period offset in the first place was for if you're having stock levels and you want to say the beginning stock in this period is the previous period um, plus, you know, minus what was ever used or lost and plus whatever was restocked. And so when we first implemented the period offset for indicators, we were thinking you just use it once. You just go back one period. And then suddenly Scott said, oh, we can use that for data element completeness. <laughs> and suddenly you have a whole new application for something that wasn't designed that way. Predictors, the reason they're called predictors is they were designed to predict uh, disease for one month based on some previous months. And then we found, oh, we can use predictors for data quality and we can use predictors for all these other things. Why are they called predictors? Well, it's because we didn't know that they would be used for anything except for disease prediction. Um, and one of the one of the best things about this session every year is you you experts always come up with immediately you immediately have new use cases for what we think we <laughs> for situations that we haven't anticipated, and you and you push us. We get a lot of actually our roadmap for things that we're going to do later in the year from this session right now. Especially George, if we ever catch up to George's requests, then. We're all done. Pack it up. <laughs> Development complete. We can all go home. Okay, next slide. Where's this is yours. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, so we wanted so circling back a bit. So we we've gone through, hopefully you're kind of picking up some of the pieces of how we're able to calculate some of the data element reporting rates. So we have the, the count override, we have the if statements, we have, and we have the ability to look back in time, right, with the period offsets. So then the next thing that we wanted to look at was uh, calculating the out the impact of outliers. Um, and this is one of those metrics, again, that gives us an indication of, is our data actually usable? What percentage of our data is actually coming from something that's not a suspected outlier um, that, could be throwing off our, our 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 national indicators, and so we have different ways, of course, or different steps that are necessary for calculating that value. Um, the first one is we have to calculate the um, outlier threshold, and this is something that we've talked about several times. But we use a, typically a predictor to calculate an outlier threshold. That outlier threshold is calculated or saved as a data element uh, coming from a predictor, and it gives us a, a value that represents however many standard deviations beyond uh, uh, each uh, value that you have saved in your database. So, um, so for example, we're able to calculate an outlier threshold for, say, ANC1 visits, and that outlier threshold is calculated for every health facility for every single uh, time A and C1 is entered, right? And it's based upon the historical data that's been entered for that organizational unit uh, for that data element. So over the course of time, this health facility has been reporting this number for A and C1, and then we are able to uh, say, based upon the history of reporting, calculate an, uh, an outlier threshold value. Uh, you can see that this one is just using a uh, standard Z-score, right? But you could also use modified Z-score because it's using the average. Yeah, So you could, but you could also use like modified Z-score and stuff. We're also looking at means of making this much more complex, factoring like time series models in. Um, 
because we know that a lot of the use cases with this are you looking at seasonal data and using modified Z score. Z score for outlier thresholds is not adequate for assessing um, outlier thresholds for seasonal data. We need more time series models for that. But that's way more complex. Uh, so we'll just keep with the basic stuff here. So the first thing that we have to do, we have to make the uh, predictor uh, that calculates the outlier threshold. Once we have that, then we're able to calculate the data elements excluding outliers. So what is my count of the data elements that have come in that are not outliers? Does that make sense? So we're able to use an if statement here. So we're saying, if this data element is less than or equal to the outlier threshold, count the data element value. If it's not, replace it with a zero. So this actually gives us a sum of the data values that are not outliers, right? Okay, so then we're able to do a, um, the, a data element for the outliers. So what is the actual amount of the values that are coming in that are outliers? So we can say, if this data element is greater than the outlier threshold, return the data element. So that's giving us a sum of all of the values that are coming that are outliers, okay? Then we also have the data element for non-outlier count. So of the data values that have come in, what number of them are not outliers? So similar situation, if the data element is less than or equal to the data element threshold, count a one. So the difference here is that we're returning the actual data value here, we're returning a one, so to get a count. Um, yeah, and then we also have the data element outlier count. So of our values that have come in, what number of them are outliers? Very similar to this one. So if the data element is less than the, da the data element threshold, then return a one. Or sorry, greater than the data element threshold, then return a one. So you're so hopefully starting to see how we can actually put these together now to give us a percentage of of the values that have come in, what percentage are outliers, and of the values that we have, what is the impact of those outliers? Okay, which I think is on the next slide. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. So, so the percentage of values that are outlier values. So that's a little bit of a tongue twister, but the numerator can be the count of our outlier values, and the denominator can be all values for that data element. Okay, and of course your factor is 100. So this gives you an indication um, uh, about changes over time and really the impact of the outlier values. In many situations where we've actually deployed this, we've done this a couple of pilots now of this, we see that the impact of outliers is really quite high. Um, so we're talking about upwards of like, on average between 10 to 15% of the values that you have coming in are uh, uh, made up of outlier values. And again, outlier values, not necessarily incorrect values, could be real values, could be accurate, but they are statistically improbable, right? Uh, and, and should be suspicious. You should investigate outliers. Um, in many cases, the likelihood of an outlier being real data is so minutely small that it's almost a guarantee to be a data quality issue, a data entry mistake. Um, and uh, and so we can we can assess the impact of that. And if we're having like 10, 15 percent of our values are coming from outliers, the actual uh, value, can we say that we can actually use that data? I think most people would say no, we can't use that data. It's it's that that impact is 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 too high and it's throwing off our uh, our uh, the uh, the national figure too much. Um, and then we also have the uh, value excluding outliers as a percentage of the total overall values. So this one, we have the values of the numerators, the values for the data element that are not outliers, and the denominator is all values for the, the data element. Um, this gives, again, an indication of how significant the outliers are for the overall data, um, which is, uh, yeah. Obviously, pretty critical. So this is these are the kind of two new ways that we're looking at it. It it, it gives us an impact on like can we how severe is the impact of the outliers? But I think more importantly, a, a nice way of looking at this is also, you know, is our data really usable? Which none of the other data quality metrics that we have explored really actually tell us that answer. 
It just shows us where the problems are. But this gives us an act, you know, somewhat of a metric of can we actually be confident in using our data, um, which I think is a is a big step for the DHIS two community to take. Before I get to this, uh, so at least one idea that that comes out of the question this gentleman here asked is we very often have uh, 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 something of the form, if some Boolean value, then a one else a zero. And maybe we could um, shorten this to something like, take the number from a Boolean value and convert the Boolean value to a number, a one or a zero. This is coming from your from your suggestion. Maybe we, maybe we could have a new function, just call it num, which would be the equivalent of if something, then one else zero. Yeah, nice idea, thanks. Um, so aside from data quality, which has been the focus of this session, and especially uh, counting data values belonging to a data element, I wanted to just go through what is new this year in indicator syntax, and then uh, some of the, the greatest hits from recent years. Um, we have, these are the things that are new this year uh, since, since we presented on this last, a year ago this time. Um, you can use a period offset inside a sub-expression, which you've seen the, the power of that. Uh, you can count uh, Boolean values in expression. This was a bug, but we fixed it. There was a question, I think, about that. Um, also, if you go to the uh, to the presentation uh, online, follow the link. Uh, these are hot hot links to the to the Jira tickets that uh, describe the feature of the bug fix. Um, we can now use. This is another request we had using nested indicators within a period offset. So you can use an indicator plus an indicator value from last period or an indicator value from whatever. Again, they're not fancy, flashy new fe features, but they're taking the features we have and just trying to, to make them more consistent and, and work better together. Um, we have two new functions for multi-select fields uh, with 241, I think. You can have... Uh, aggregate fields that are multi-select. And if you use the new data, uh, what it is, you define a data element and you base it on an option set. And the option set is configured for multi-select. And when you do that, then in the data entry app, when you go to fill in that value, it will give you a drop down. You can select one or more values. They're actually stored in the database as comma separated. So if you, uh, in, in the data value table, so if you choose latex allergy and also mold allergy, those are stored at latex allergy, comma, mold allergy in the data value table. And so, again, we can't really report in indicators uh, from those text values, but you can in an indicator say, you know, how many, uh, how many uh, items did we have that were either latex allergy or mold allergy? by using this contains items. And this will parse the string and look for an exact match within the comma separated list. Or you can say just contains, and this will match any substring in a multi-select or in any text. App. So you can just say, look for allergy, and this will get all the, all the if there's any instance of allergy at all in the field, it will pick up that in the contains feature. And, and this works for program indicators as well. Yes. right. And these are implemented uh, across the board, program indicators, indicators, uh, predictors, validation rules. So you can imagine a scenario where we have a, an enrollment or program indicator where we say, count the number of patients that came in that had a latex allergy and a mold allergy and whatever else. That all of that is coming from a single drop down menu that's a multi select option set. And before I take the question, I'll just do the last thing. We also have comments finally, and you can put comments in, in any kind of expression. Uh, using the the standard C, Java, uh, other languages as well, syntax. Yes. The question is, uh, how does this fire? If we have contains items, this this means or latex allergy or mold allergy. If it's if it contains 
any of those items. And if you want to do it contains both of those items, then you'd have to do uh, contains items latex allergy and contains items mold allergy. Do you mean F-H-I-R or F-I-R-E? If you select latex allergy and you multi select, and then on your rule you have contain allergy, will it uh, be evaluated to true? Or uh, because it's not uh, allergy but it's latex allergy, it could be evaluated to false. It's important because then you have to be careful that you have no uh, option that could be contained in another option. I'm not sure I. like if you had two options instead of this latex allergy and mold allergy you had one that was just allergy mm. and the second that was mold allergy like the entire first option is contained in the second option with that cause the problem okay. good yeah so the 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 answer there is if you do just contains it will just look for any substring so if any any value has allergy anywhere in it it will come up that way but contains items looks for the full thing with limited by parentheses. So if we're looking for latex underscore allergy or mold underscore allergy, this will not match something that's just allergy by itself. So if you use the contains function, it will match anything with allergy in it. If you use this function, it looks for exactly these things. Yeah, the first one uses actually just uses a substring uh, uh, a search within a string, but the second one will actually, you know, break it apart by the commas and then it's look for an exact match. Are you guys thinking about like ICD eleven? Is that the reason? Because then you then you have like a layers of options essentially, right? You have you have like, you know, like different categorizations of cause of death, right? And then you have options within those, and then you and within those options you have more options until you get down. This is not nearly as complex as that. So if that's we were, case, we were that, trying that, to figure out which, really which one of these to implement, then we said just just implement them both. It's easy. There's a question back there. Is there any limitation on the number of items? I don't believe so. It just comes from an option set. You define an option set, you define all the options. And then you assign that option set to the data element. Yeah, I, I think the limitation is how terribly long do you want to present an option set to your end user trying to capture the data? Because there's no there's no limit here. But you don't if you're an end user using DHS trying to enter data in DHS two, you don't want to scroll through a list of hundreds of options. It'll it'll be a single drop. Which down. is why there's a separate ICD eleven app for DHS two, and we're not doing that in here. Hmm. The code of the options? At, at the moment, options are very simple. They're they're just text, and text is what you enter. Text no, is what is stored. No, but there's, you know, in the options, there's the code, and then there's the name. This is referencing the code. OK. But someone might just double check that JIRA ticket for me and make sure I'm right. There's a community effort here. Thank you. Fact check each other. Next. Um. Here are some of the other recent greatest hits. Uh, if statement, you know, very very useful general purpose tool, works like the Excel function, if something, then if true, if, if false. Um, if, the, if there is a value in one or more things, can be very useful not only for uh, uh, compactness of your writing your expression, but if the value you're testing is a program indicator, that's going through nested subqueries and taking a long time to execute, you want to see if that program indicator returns this or this or this. You don't have to say if the program indicator equals this or if the program indicator equals that, and now you're evaluating the program indicator twice. Or if the program indicator equals the third thing, now you're evaluating it three times. You can evaluate it once, and you say if it's in two comma three comma whatever you want. Uh, you can test if something is null, if something is not null. This was uh, something that 
uh, again, first non-null in a sequence. Again, if you have a program indicator, and as was shown in the last, in some previous session, if the program indicator is uh, null, then you want to put in a zero. Rather than saying, if it's if it's if the program indicator is not null, then put in a the program indicator itself. Now you're evaluating it twice. Else put in zero. You can just say take the first non-null between the program indicator and a zero, and that will put the zero in if the program indicator is null. Um, there's a, also a null keyword, so you can say if some test, then make it null. And that means it will wipe out the value. You'll see nothing in a pivot table instead of seeing a zero, if that's what you want to see in place of a zero. And remove zeros uh, is just a quicker way of doing that. It's the same as if the value equals zero, then put in the keyword null. Otherwise, put in the value. But again, if you have a program indicator, something that takes a long time to execute, here, remove zeros just executes it once. Whereas here you might you might be executing it two different times. Um, other things we have a we have a greatest function, so you don't have to say you know if this is greater than that return this. You can just say return the greatest of these two things, or return the least of these two things, or three or four, any number you want. These were uh, patterned after the uh, Postgres. Uh, syntax has has uh, database functions with exactly those names and that syntax and a variable number of arguments. You can, in an indicator, you can have a minimum and or a maximum date. And this is great if you're if you've changed your data elements over the years. You could say, well, before 2019, you know, this count was included in this data element, but after 2019, it's not included in that data element anymore. So you have to count it independently. You don't want to get double counting if you're going, and so you can use in an indicator to let the indicator change over the years. I know many systems would have, you know, this is my 2018 indicator because then the logic changed. This is my 2019 indicator, and this allows you to make one indicator that evolves through time as your uh, as your data changes. Um, there's a year uh, year to date function. Uh, which says, you know, from the start of the calendar year until now, what's the sum of the values? And uh, that can be useful for like you're having a, a vaccination uh, rates. You can see how it progresses during the year, uh, the cumulative vaccinations year to date. Uh, and in, to use with the year to date function, we have two constants. There's period and year. So if you're doing a monthly report, this will be a one for January, uh, two for February, and so on. If you're doing a weekly report, this will be one for week one, two for week two, and so on. And you can do that by saying, what's the year to date? And maybe I want to know what's the average in the month. What's the average monthly value year to date? Or what's the average weekly value year to date? And then the yearly period account lets you, you know, divide by I'm in the fifth year, I'm in the fifth month but there are 12 months in the year. So I'm five twelfths of the way through my report. And if someone runs the same indicator for weekly, then it'll be, I'm the second uh, week in the year, but there are 52 weeks in the, in, the, in, the, in the year. And so those, you can use those constants and then you don't have to worry about what the user is gonna select for, for the period when they run the indicator. Um. One thing to note here with the min date and the max date, if you're trying to keep up with the latest WHO indicator definitions, then you're going to probably have to end up using these because, you know, WHO is, you know, rightfully changing the way in which we're ca we need to calculate indicators based upon changes in clinical treatment regimes, right? As we, you know, for example, like what the percentage of children that are fully immunized. As we add more immunizations, as we change the course of treatment for uh, administering immunizations, the way in which that calculator, or the way in which that indicator has to be calculated is is going to change. Um, and so, do you want to have? So this allows you to say, I have one indicator for fully immunized children, but it's changing over time based upon how the clinical, how WHO is recommending the indicator to be counted, as opposed to what we've seen in the past is, you have 
five different indicators for fully immunized based upon five different WHO uh, recommendations for how it should be calculated. And you're like, and you, and if you're a poor district health officer, you're like, which one do I choose? I don't know. Right. So this allows you to have just one. Next slide. Yep. Yeah. That's, That's the end. We have. Go ahead. We have bonus content if you're keen on it. You don't have to be. But we did. We do have more if you're into it. For those. Yeah. 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 No worries. Go for it. Oh, yeah, yeah, you want me to go all the way back? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Go this way. Wait, this one? Okay. So this is, I mean, this is just the upper threshold, right? Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And is it, and this example is, like, for a given period? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes, you can do it for over, but if you want to do it over time, we stuck in the word predictor up there. This is one thing that you yeah. will still need a predictor for if you wanted to say, base my uh, threshold, base my outlier expectation on the last 12 months. You could write a predictor for that, and it would put that back into the data value table and then use an indicator to compare against the, that. Yeah. threshold and this is the upper bounds because it's the plus you could do minus and then you'd have the lower bounds operationalize this because i've looked at the distribution of our data before and it's not normally distributed like yeah we have a million ones because we just aggregate by a million things so everyone's putting like one in every box but there's one person who's exactly this age and female experience with this so I was just thinking about how we could And I think we'd want to do it like or unit wise also yeah. because we can't compare the value to this from like hospital to like a clinic. Exactly. Yeah, you, you really hit the nail on the head with that one. We need to do a couple things. The first one is we have to kind of build in some kind of factor for sensitivity based upon patient load. So like if they're putting in ones every single month and then the one month they put in a two it's going to be an outlier, right? <laughs> or they're putting in zeros every single month and then one month is a one, you know, like, and do we really need to flag that? No, right? Um, so we need to have some sensitivity uh, to the historical trend, which is, um, which we're trying to figure out exactly how we build that in. So that's that's going to be part of it. The other one, of course, is this works great, as I am pointed out, for, for normally distributed data. So, you know, the bell curve. But if you have non-normally distributed data, anything that's seasonal, and what we're actually realizing as we start to implement one of these, so much data that we assume is not seasonal is actually seasonal, like birth rates. So many countries have seasonal birth rates. And not until you really get in the data and start trying to do outlier analysis do you realize like everybody's dropping their babies at the same time. <laughs> not to be crass about it, but yeah. Norway has seasonal birth rates. Everyone has birth has. That's why you see so many pregnant women right now walking around Oslo is because everyone's trying to have their kid before the cutoff for daycare, which is coming up. No, I'm serious. And so like you can see there's like you expect most baby baby births to be pretty normal, but they're not. And so the question is, what do we do with that? So what we're trying to do is um, working with uh, the AI team. If you guys saw the AI presentation, maybe not, um, and the machine learning team to apply um, time series models, automatically look at the data, look at the data distribution, apply a time series model that's the best fit, and then base all of our calculations off of that time series model as opposed to just doing, uh, assuming everything's normally distributed. And if we do that for time series models, then, you know, this becomes a much more accurate, much more, um, uh, I'd say, reliable to any kind of distribution of your data over time. And, and to add on to that, you know, until we get to more sophisticated tools, if you know your data, you don't have to use this as your threshold expression for the prediction. That's true, too. Say, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 a minimum of this and four. Hey. So you're, you're, you, won't, you won't be flagging the ones that turn into twos. And now that I'm thinking about it, although I've never done it, you could actually have multiple of these that apply to different 
facilities based upon the values that they have reported. So you could have one like this is, you could have like four or five standard deviations for small facilities. And then you can have another one that's like two standard deviations for really big facilities. And then you could have DHIS2 assess, is this value big or small based upon the other value, the, the, the proportion of values that are entered, and then apply the one that is appropriate and then calculate. You could do that. Yeah. Yes, and in a, in a predictor, that's exactly what you can do. You mm -hmm. can look over as many months as you want of past data. Um, one thing that you could do uh, using a combination, just to kind of round us out, you could, say, make an indicator that is the um, average value over the last 12 months, for example, right? And then you could compare the current value against the last 12 months value on a on a scatter plot and then run your outlier analysis on the scatter plot and then it would be plain as day where the outliers are without having to do all of this rigmarole everything's possible but we need more use cases honestly so this is all brand new i mean like honestly like brand new we've only piloted it one time in rwanda and it was kind of like a hobby thing. So we're looking for more countries and implementations to, to work with this on. If you're keen, please let us know and we can work with you. Yeah. Yeah, so it becomes a bit of met, uh, metadata that has to be created. So the good news with that is we kind of anticipated that problem and we have a meta we have an application that will automatically create the metadata for you. Uh, it's still kind of in beta phase right now, but hopefully we can release that in the next couple of months. And so that if you want to do this, you can say, okay, this is my data element, create all of the data quality checks that you, we need, all the metadata for that. And then it'll automatically just spit it out for you. Ask you. Uh, on this uh, the calculations, uh, especially on if you include main calculations, especially on uh, on a checker program with the, this long setup, are we not can we not affect the the, the performance of the especially a checker program? Because we run a, some of the checker program, especially the state management. Yeah. Then we include a lot of uh, calculation. You know, even <laughs> a lot of calculation. So uh, my question is, uh, are we not, can we uh, this thing affect the the, the performance? You know, yeah, the performance of the checker, especially when you're someone using a mobile app. Yeah, I, I think. Mobile phone. Yeah, I think I think um, uh, well, a, a few things to say there. I think the the main use case for this is mostly aggregated data. So you are probably not running this on raw tracker data. This kind of analysis, you would be probably aggregating your tracker data using like tracker to ag or sorry yeah tracker to aggregate or something populating aggregate data elements from your tracker data and then running it on your aggregated data elements um you could possibly run it on your tracker data elements but this would only tell you yeah i mean i don't i'm not sure that would actually be you could do that but 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 to answer the other question is, will it affect performance? There are a thousand ways to bring your tracker instance to its knees, right? Um, so I think I think this is probably not as bad as a program indicator that just says return all enrollments. That's where that's where we really struggle is when you don't put any we don't put any uh, qualifiers or conditions on your program indicators, your enrollment program indicators. Because it's very easy to make a program indicator that just says, return all men. Give me the count of the number of men, male patients. And then it's just like, okay, that's processing a ton of data. This is actually, I think, would actually be a, a smaller operate, a smaller amount of data. It's not necessarily the calculation always. It's the amount of data that gets pulled into the calculation. Um, but if you're having big tracker implementations, I think the general practice is to, if like really, really big ones, to have, uh, I think it's a good practice to have separate databases, one that's 
data entry and then one that's aggregation and one that's analytics so that you're not having your 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 read and write databases at the same time because you're right i mean like if there's a th if there's 5000 people during a campaign trying to enter data into a averagely built track dhis2 instance in terms of like server uh, uh and infrastructure then yeah it could bring it to its knees for sure uh, we do have a lot more guidance on this. We have a lot of guidance on minimal specs for servers and infrastructure out available. Um, and then I also highly encourage stress testing. You can't assume everything that we produce will work for you. But that's why it's open source and the license, not our fault. But we do want to help you. Lars, don't quote me on that. Oh, there's a question. Sorry. Since DHS2 is expanding, is this Anthony? Yeah, okay. Since DHS2 is expanding to LMIS and EMIS education, would you also consider non-numeric data types like dates, e.g. Ex, uh, expiry dates in the expression of a predictor? George, what do you think? Should we do it? Okay. So George is saying, then you have to have a data filled with an expiry date in the first place. Anthony, I would like to introduce you to George. And George is our LMIS expert. Um, so if George thinks it's a good idea, then I don't really have an opinion. I'll just do what George wants me to do. Another note is that in, in predictors or indicators, you can compare a date to a fixed constant string. You just put quote uh, year, dash two digit month dash two digit day and you can say less than or equal greater than whatever and that will return you can put that in if statement and make a test his name is george mcguire it's george at dhs2.org put that in the comments other questions any last questions we have five minutes want to go for extra content or not yeah <laughs> you're on scott that's me yeah you start it and i'll finish it that's how most things go okay the end kind of extra content uh hard to know what you are um so so here we're looking at just uh, these are a bit of refreshers we've gone through some of these before but you know a lot of you are new to the conference or just seeing this for the first time so um one of the things that we have is uh annualized indicators so in dhs2 if you if you if you have it etched into your mind like like most of us probably do at this point when you're building an indicator you have the tick box that says annualized and i think lars you made this annualized button a long time ago yeah, about a decade. Yeah. It's not the best. Uh, so it was good then, uh, but it actually is not a really great way of calculating it. So what the annualized button does is it basically just assumes that month's value is going to be basically the same for the for a whole year, and then it calculates the indicator based upon that. To be fair, though, it was the best we had for many, many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and large is still the best, but that... It, yeah, as no, nah, okay. It's okay. Well, um, so what we're able to do now is we're able to, um, yeah, using the the period offset functionality, is we're actually able to add up a value over time. So you say like, I want an actual annualized, so I can say this month plus last month plus last, but the month before that plus the month before that plus the month before that. Uh, and actually get a real value for your numerator um, if you're comparing against targets as opposed to, yeah, exactly. So um, uh, as opposed to just saying, I assume this month's value is the same for the entire 12-month period, which is what that annualized button does. Does it make sense? So it's kind of using that period offset. So just another example of something that should probably be done. Um, yeah, just like this. So using period offset, you can get a rolling average of what was true for the 12 months leading up to this month. Right. And then so these are kind of indicators that are like, am I on track for my annual targets or something like that, right? Uh, you can use these period offsets to get a, 
bet an accurate calculation of that as opposed to actually using the annualized button. The other one is um, a big one for immunization is the ability using if conditional statements to categorize um, data. So, for example, if you're familiar with immunization, you expect to have uh, an immunization coverage at a certain percentage and then a dropout rate at a, at a percentage. And that gives you a categorization of is it is the immunization going well in this area or not going well? Right. Um, and so in this example, you can yeah string together an if statement and say, if the data value, if the coverage is greater than 90 and the dropout rate is less than or equal to 10, then return a category one. And category two is if the coverage is greater than or equal to 90 and the dropout rate is greater than 10. And so that gets you, you can just return ones, one, two, three, and four associated with the category. You can build a legend and you can say, if it's one, be green, two, yellow, or yeah, whatever. Um, and so you can build these um, EPI categorization charts for immunization programs. So this is like, this categorization is a very standard immunization program kind of thing. So just as an example of what you're able to do, a more practical example of what you're able to do with these kinds of if conditional statements. Um, and this here's is the actual code, what you put in your, your indicator. Yeah. If the thing is less than 10 and it's, um, and sorry, if it's between 10 and 90, do this. If it's, if it's, no, if it's less, oh, we're looking at two different things. Back Are the, we? I think so. Back to the other, I mean, we're doing it the right thing, but we're looking at the coverage rate and the dropout rate. Right. Is a combination of whether we're, we're. Uh, red, yellow, green, or whatever the other color is. Two different shades of green. Yeah. And so this is is looking at the two different, if that's less than or equal to 10, if the coverage rate is less than or 10, and the dropout rate is greater than or equal to 90, if I, if I remember mm -hmm. from the, or did I reverse them? I yeah. reversed them. <laughs> Something like <laughs> the that. The dropout yeah. rate is that, less than or, the yeah. coverage rate. So this yeah. is how you'd, you'd bake it. One, uh, one important thing to point out here is people often ask us, can we reference an indicator in an indicator? And the answer is yes, you can. This is the, you have to put an in and then the UID of the indicator. We already used I for program indicator. So we had to use N for a regular indicator. Yeah. It's not in the user experience, in the user interface. You don't see an option for like, just like you see with the data elements, you can go in and choose your data elements and double click them and then they come into the expression. It doesn't exist there for indicators, but you can reference indicators. It's kind of a hidden feature. I think, yeah, we have time for one question and then we're done. Done, done. No, it's not new. Yeah. We could do this since 2.34. Yeah, so maybe you've been struggling for a while, but no, but today's the day. It is. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. So um, uh, if you have any questions, we can hang out for a little bit. Uh, but then, yeah, that's the end of the extra content. So thanks. Thank you.